Alum Creek, an essay by Edmund Kelly. All of us, if we are to become functioning adults, must have in our childhood a place of our own. There must be some refuge from the cold indifference of an uncomprehending world. We need a cave into which to retreat, to salve our wounds, to plot revenge, to conceive a better order where one's proper role is acknowledged. The place is not perpetually gloomy, however. It is also a place of celebration, somewhere we can privately exult over some triumph that may seem too minor to others to warrant such emotion. The important thing is that it is ours. Depending upon the circumstances of one's youth, the place can take many forms. For some, it may be a corner of a basement or attic, a tree house, or even a tree limb. If one is blessed with acreage, it may be an actual cave or a distant hill. If one is less fortunate, it may be one's own room. Or for those truly unfortunate, forced to share a room, it may be only the space under the covers of one's bed. No matter. The critical thing is that there be space in which to first cope with the demands of an intruding world, and then from which to gradually begin to push back the borders until the two are merged and the boundaries can no longer be traced. My place was the creek. Alum Creek, to be more precise. Everything is determined by geography. The house in Ohio, which I grew up, was just north of the small village of Kilburn. It sat facing west, across the road that rang directly in front of it. Virtually all the cultivated land of the farm lay across the road. To the north of the house sat a large barn, a small milk house, and a few sheds, their fronts also oriented toward the road, and thus we presented ourselves to the world and society facing to the west. Behind the house, to the east, was a more private area, unseen from the road or any other outsider's vantage point, and best appreciated from a boy's upstairs back bedroom window. There, the land extended for a hundred yards or so, then began its gentle descent of perhaps a hundred feet to the flood plain of the creek, which ran north to south, parallel to the road. The grade was not uniform. To the north behind the barn, it was a long, steady decline that might have been fashioned in anticipation of the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act, at least if dairy cows were covered under it. Directly behind the house, though, the decree of incline sharpened, providing an increasing degree of challenge for a growing sledder each winter, winter. Finally, it turned to a vertical bank at the end of our property and the edge of Kilburn. Across the creek and beyond, a small floodplain turned up again to form a small ridge parallel to the creek. The land here was wooded and too hilly for farming suitable only for cattle pasture, berry picking, and never a completed exploration. To my regret, I never traced Alum Creek to its source. I presume it rises somewhere in Morrow County, just northeast of Delaware County, in which Kilburn was located. It flows nearly straight south to the eastern Columbus area, where it empties into the Sicoto River which continues due south, entering the Ohio River near Portsmouth. I sometimes stared at maps and marveled that the familiar little Alum Creek persevered on to become part of the Gulf of Mexico and even the Atlantic. Was that a sign? A portent? Supposedly, the creek derives its name from the presence of traces of a bitter white substance called alum by most or potassium aluminum sulfate, by those who take seriously such things as chemistry. It had astringent qualities. My mother kept a bottle of alum powder for the treatment of cold sores in the mouth. Whatever other uses it may have had are unknown to me. A few times, but only rarely, I found attached to rocks in the water white gossamer strands 
which proved to be bitter to the taste. Such discoveries served to generate fantasies of a career of scientific triumphs, fantasies decisively shattered by the first college chemistry course. But on Alum Creek, all was yet possible. Just before entering our property, Alum Creek changed its course from west to south, apparently because it ran headlong into a bank composed of layers of black shale. Atop the shale was an already ancient, long ago fully occupied cemetery. Though the laws of physics and geology argued against it, it was a matter of some certainty in my youngest days that one day a particularly high spring flood would tumble uncovered coffins into the creek. This event I would be the first to report to horrified adults who did not, having no good reason, often venture to this area. A career reporting on natural disasters seemed logical and not unwelcome consequence. One more among ever-expanding possibilities. At this bend below the cemetery, the creek slowed and broadened, becoming almost pond-like. It was no more than a couple feet deep at most, and the floor was flat black shale covered with a thin film of moss. The footing was treacherous for a small barefoot boy, and even more so for the large, clumsy cows balancing on small, sharp hooves. Little fence was needed here to keep them from their eternal quest for that evergreener grass. Further downstream, behind the barn, the creek narrowed, and the bottom turned to gravel and pleasantly smoothed shards of slate. At a point midway between the house and the barn, and hidden from both the creekside trees a single large round rock inexplicably appeared in midstream. It was at least four feet in diameter and protruded some two feet above the water level. The increased velocity of the water diverted around it created a sort of ditch surrounding it. Consequently, a boy could approach it in water up to his knees only to find that as he neared it, the water rose to his armpits as he scratched for finger and toe holds to haul himself atop of it. I named it Turtleback, and for a long time it was my place within the creek. It was generally in the sun, and it was pleasant to sit shivering and dripping and slowly absorb the warmth of the rock. Then there were hours to be spent watching twigs and leaves borne along their rapidly moving water, or contemplating the clouds while sprawling on the rock. Legs dangled in the cold water. I was in clear view of any who might pass along the creek bank, only a few feet higher than the rock. But I felt I was in my most private place, invisible to all and secure from all I then thought threatening. And in truth, I suppose I was. Downstream from there, and pretty much directly behind the house, the creek broadened somewhat and deepened. Here the shale apparently dipped, for the bottom was now mud. For some reason, the east bank rose to five or six feet. The gradual slope of the west bank was of gravel and shale remnants. This was the tree-shaded swimming hole everyone places at the center of their vision of your rural childhood. In truth, two or three strong strokes could carry an adult across it, and not many more would take him from the shallows at one end to those of the other. But the water was slow-moving and generally rose to the neck of a boy ten or less. Heavy rains increased its speed and raised its depth to a satisfyingly scary level. This was the first step away from Turtleback and into deeper waters. Its inadequacy was an actual swimming hole lasted only a couple of years, that is, until I no longer felt panicked at being more than a few feet from the solid ground. However, it continued as a favored spot, though more to my dog Brownie than to myself. It was part of our tacit agreement. I would spend hours skipping bits of flat shale across the still water, he tirelessly sought to catch them in the air, or, failing that, bounded splashing after them till they sank. 
Then he faced back to me to await the next. In return, when my arm tired, he agreed to sit and listen patiently to my catalog of complaints of uncomprehending adults, peers unfairly gifted in athletics, overly demanding teachers, and eventually incomprehensible girls. One summer, probably in one of the late elementary school years, this area was magically transformed from its role as a now disdained swimming hole to a boat works, a launching point for a wondrous vessel. High waters often left intriguing debris along the creek. In those days before the concept of ecology existed, farmers and others, our family included, disposed of old lumber, furniture, containers, etc., in a straightforward manner. The material was placed near a creek or river, leaving it to the periodic floods to convey the unwanted junk out of sight downstream. Since those upstream did the same, we kids were the beneficiaries of a constantly changing trove to be mined for unexpected treasures. One such flood deposited a couple of rusty 50-gallon oil drums, empty and with their screwed-in tops securely attached. Their potential use revealed itself to me in a flash of inspiration, unfortunately rarely repeated. They could provide the buoyancy for a raft that would carry me to unknown adventures as had that of Huck Finn, whose journey had probably recently inspired me. I shared my revelation with two or three colleagues, and together we constructed a raft perhaps seven or eight feet long and the height of an oil drum wide. Probably even the term raft is grandiose, for the vessel had emerged from our boatyard. Four short two-by-fours defined a top and bottom for each drum. Two poles on either side connected the drums, which floated on the sides. One could sit or stand on the drum. Propulsion and steerage was achieved by the poles worked over the sides of the vessel or in the empty space between the two drums. I was certain, and probably correct, that it was the most splendidly seaworthy craft ever sighted on the upper Alum Creek. This is not to say that it was without problems that even I acknowledged. Although it had a draft, even when fully crude, of no more than five, six inches, this was sufficient to cause it to run aground every few feet, or more often if the creek was low. Progress was slow, especially upstream. But no matter. The important thing was that we were moving on a craft of our own making and under our own control. The adventure lasted for more than one summer until quickly rising waters carried away the noble craft to parts unknown. The construction and navigation details are mostly gone now. What remains is a clear recollection of the strange exhilaration I experienced each time I first pulled the raft free of the land on which it had rested. There was adrenaline rush as I felt free of the land and all the predictability it governed. Although I've flown in dozens of light planes and piloted it an ultra light, I never had that same feeling of release until I bought a houseboat some 50 years later. Then I remembered and relived that same thrill each time I loosed the lines and drifted free of the slip. But where to go on Little Alum Creek? A couple of times the raft took us to the bridge east of Kilburn, but that was as far as we could go and still make the laborious return upstream before night fell. Further exploration would have to wait an age when I could disappear for the entire day on my bike. Or eventually, oh, ultimate freedom, to be old enough to be found acceptable company to one who had his driver's license. Then a whole new world unfold. That world centered around the Butmans. That is a term by which it was introduced to me and by which I have known it for several years. Only gradually did it dawn on me that we were corrupting the term abutments. It seemed that several decades earlier, transportation officials anticipating the demands of a Kilburn, sure to grow explosively, had begun to build a railroad bridge across Alum Creek a couple of miles downstream. There was no trace of a crossing span that had 
ever been put into place. There was no discernible trace on either side of the creek of efforts to build a road to this crossing. Only the two towers, piles of carefully hewn rectangular cubes of rock, remained. How and why they came into existence was as great a mystery to me as the origins of Machu Picchu in Peru would be much later. The important thing was that, as part of my labors, these long-departed visionaries had dug earth from the floor of the creek between the two structures. The result was a hard-to-improve swimming hole. The central depression of a depth generally over one's head was surrounded by a gently sloping surface which allowed for a variety of activities. The Butmans contributed to my education in many ways. In addition to the attributes noted above, the Butmans was hundreds of yards from the nearest gravel road. This made it relatively inaccessible to adults. It was therefore a natural magnet for teens, near teens, and those slightly past. Once I had reached an age that allowed day-long absences on my bike, whole new vistas opened. Much education was gained by carefully insinuating myself with the groups of older boys. I began to acclimate a list of topics, carefully noting which caused for a, called for a sneer, an amused chuckle, an amen like, yeah, or a knowing leer. The fact that I often knew nothing of these subjects beyond recognized keywords did nothing to dampen the enthusiasm which, with which I joined the chorus of reaction. However, many of such mysteries quickly reveal themselves to young boys who, all evidence to the contrary, can be diligent students. This is especially so when confronted with subjects they have been advised by elders that they do not need to know. There was one topic which drew my increasing attention because it resisted persistent analysis, and perhaps for reasons of hormonal as well. That was the mystery of sex. Lacking the educational resource of sisters and dependent for tutoring on a painfully shy mother, I recognized my ignorance of the other sex would place me at a serious disadvantage as I entered my teens. Listening to older boys was of little help. The discussion of the subject tended to consist mainly of cryptic allusions punctuated by nervous winks and gaffs. Only later did I realize these were diversions intended to conceal an ignorance nearly as deep as my own. I could only hope to increase my knowledge through direct but discreet observation. The Butmans offered one opportunity early on. I don't recall the circumstances which found me alone on top of one of the towers, lying stretched out in the sun. I know there was a large mixed group swimming in the deepest part. I had just left them and was drying in the sun, perhaps in preparation for the long ride back home. Suddenly I realized I was privy to portions of the conversation of two girls standing directly below me in shallow water near the shore. Peering over the edge, I recognized them as two who were a year older and lived in the town of Kilburn. With them I was generally somewhat intimidated by the sophistication implied by their age, gender, an urban lifestyle, the fact that the father of one was the school superintendent and the father of the other was the owner of a grocery store and postmaster as well, only added to my assumption of their worldliness. More to the point that day was the fact I both lacked brothers. I did not hear what led up to the question, but one suddenly asked if the other had ever seen her father without clothes. The second replied that she had, but only from the rear. After a brief pause to acknowledge that there was little more to say on the subject, they turned to the other things. There was no such frustration on my part. I had stumbled upon the important fact that girls, if these were representative, not only shared my ignorance, but my interest as well. This was an important discovery to be carefully filed away for its future value. Not all education afforded by the creek came so easily. Some was required at great cost 
the extent of which can only be appreciated if one recalls we are considering the late 1940s, long before the revolutions of the 60s. One lesson was absorbed a bit later at a time I was part of a large mixed group swimming on a brilliant summer day. I was probably the youngest one there, then perhaps being 11 or 12. The rest of the crowd was mostly high schoolers, and I have no recollection of how I managed to insinuate myself. As the afternoon wore on, several of the boys devised a means to assure excitement and general hilarity. They would quietly maneuver directly behind some presumably unsuspecting girl and crouch down in the muddy, opaque, waist-deep water. They would then shout her name. When she turned, they would spring into the air to reveal that they had lowered their trunks to their ankles. This invariably produced from the girls satisfying amounts of shrieks, splashing, eventual averting of eyes, and warnings that such acts were never to be repeated which, of course, they were. Had they been repeated only by the others, my day might have gone much better. The need to secure my place among the ranks of my seniors was too strong, however. I was too quickly selected, an intended victim, solely based on her proximity, which was relatively removed from the other girls. In this, I was neither the first nor the last of my gender to confuse accessibility with compatibility. In any event, once directly behind her, I crouched and lowered my trunks, then called her name. She turned and I sprang into the air. Due either to the shallowness of the water or the vigor of my leap, my feet nearly cleared the water. Lacking my exuberance, my water-filled trunks followed reluctantly and only high enough to tangle my feet as they began their descent. It was only with my great effort that I retained my balance and averted pitching ignoramously face down in the water before her. Having ignored the differing physiological properties of a vigorously propelled body and its attached but inert trunks was only the latest of my miscalculations. The girl I had chosen for this little ballet adieu was probably the oldest one there, a friend's sister whom who had only spoken frequently. She was a junior, or even a senior, perhaps. She was a serious and studious sort named Martha. Worst of all, she had both an older and a younger brother. My gender's characteristics of whatever nature were of little mystery to her. As I floundered to regain my footing, I found I was confronted not with the hysterical protest, even feigned, of a shocked schoolgirl, Rather, I looked up into the steely gaze of a disapproving school marm. I'm not surprised at the others, but I expected better of you, Pat, she said in a low voice. In the thunderous silence that followed, I rearranged my trunks as best as I could in a crouching position. I then stood, turned, and walked away with all the dignity of which a helplessly humiliated twelve-year-old is capable. Through my head may have appeared erect and my shoulders squared, they were in reality bent almost double by the awful foreknowledge that this whole sex thing was going to be much more complex than older boys would have one believe. All lessons, if they were to be truly learned, involved some pain. Not all were as devastating as the foregoing. Most of the things I learned from the creek, I learned alone while skating, for instance. Skating had appealed to me from the first time I was able, by pulling on several layers of socks to fill the battered hockey skates handed down to me. It was partly the feeling of free and graceful motion, partially the speed that could be achieved, partially the satisfaction of finding that diligent practice that was rewarded fairly quickly with improved technique. If truth was told, it was probably mostly due to the fact that, except for impromptu attempts at hockey, with rarely more than three on a side, skating was a solitary sport. Through most of my youth, I was one who today would be described as athletically challenged. I'd learned early that when teams were organized for pickup games, I would be among the last chosen. But skating was different. 
In this one area, I was confident, and I outclassed my peers and many of my elders. Unfortunately, points could not be scored, and thus there was no way such triumphs could be registered. During most winters, the creek provided only scattered spots for skating in those places where the water ran deep and sluggish. The shallow rapids almost always ran free. One winter, when I was a freshman or sophomore, the creek froze far more than normal. Only a few rapids were visible, and in most cases there was ice along the banks providing passage between them. A skater was no longer limited to the few sluggish spots, but could travel for miles. And that is just what I did one cold weekend afternoon. I left my accustomed small rink behind the house, passed under the bridge at Kilburn, breezed past the buntments, taking time for wide swooping circles over the swimming site, and then continued onto strange territory. Eventually, I passed under a bridge I estimated to carry Route 37. I was exhilarated by the ability to cover long distances so rapidly. Beyond that, I was positively intoxicated by the feeling of solidarity con- accomplishment. I was certain none of my colleagues had ever skated this far, and I could recall no claims by my elders to have done so. The thought that I alone was achieving something never done before made me downright giddy or at least clad my judgment. Despite the warmth from my continuous activity, I sensed the sun was lowering and the evening chill would soon follow. My curiosity kept pushing me around just one more curve of the creek, but I finally realized I had to begin my return home. Shortly after I did so, I approached too near to an open ripple before swerving to avoid it. An almost covered rock caught my toe when I pitched forward on hands and knees into the open water only a few inches deep. Though my sleeves and trousers were soaked, that was not my real problem. As I pushed myself upright and turned to return to the ice surface, my right leg collapsed under me and I sprawled flat on the ice. Puzzled, I pushed myself up more cautiously. Again, my leg collapsed and this time I lay on the ice to consider the situation. At this point, the pain in my right knee began to assert itself. I realized now that my knee had struck a sizable submerged rock. I rolled over and tentatively straightened it, then bent it. Although painful, I seemed to be able to move it normally. Once again, I carefully raised myself to stand. Once again, I fell. After a few more futile attempts, I pulled myself to the bank and sat on a rock to ponder my prospects. The sun was beginning to sink. I saw no houses. The Route 37 bridge was still out of sight. Shouting would do no good. Even if I could walk, I did not look forward to limping for unknown miles through the snow in stocking feet. I had no matches, and what I remembered from Boy Scouts about starting a fire without them seemed now to be farcical. I sat, contemplated my situation, and shivered. Slowly it began to dawn on me that I was totally alone and that no one knew where I was. No one was going to appear to rescue me from this dilemma, as had always been the case in the past. My outlook darkened with the lowering sun. After toying with the macabre images of discovering my lifeless frozen form, I felt a heavy blanket of self-pity cover me. To shake it off, I dropped to my hands and knees to consider how far I might crawl. My knee was now even more sore and tender to the hard ice, but I sensed that my leg was now more responsive to command. I dropped back to a sitting position and stretched it before me with my hands. Tentatively, I tried to flex it and had to restrain myself when I saw that my knee had begun to rise a few painful inches. It might not be useless after all. Somehow I had the sense to realize that the knee's return to normal would have to be made at its own pace. My task would be to restrain myself as I gently put it to the test of successful degrees of mobility. Eventually, I managed to stand painfully and with the right leg bearing almost its full share of the weight. I sat back on the rock to contemplate the possibility that I might not perish alone and unnoticed. The key would be to contain my panic. 
force myself to stop and rest frequently, try to ignore the gathering darkness which changed the now black ice and open water to an unnerving similarity. I don't know how long it took me to get back to where I had left my shoes and trudge up the hill to the house where dinner had finished. My mother's immediate reaction was visible relief at my appearance, quickly followed by the demands to know where I'd been and why I could not learn to return at the proper time, and warnings of how my liberty would be curtailed if such lapses reoccurred. Even at that age, I recognized that her remonstrations were made more to assuage and conceal her fears than in hope of my reform. I saw no need to increase the former and mumbled my apologies for not minding the time, accepting without my usual protest her slowly subsiding grumbling over my lack of responsibility. Later, in a warm bed, I briefly reviewed the latest lesson the creek had imparted. It was one I had still failed to entirely master many years later. That was that the line that separates independence from isolation is faint, facilitating and difficult to discern. It was not the last time I lost sight of it. In reviewing these now distant events, I found why it was so easy for so many writers to succumb to the analogy of time as a river. It makes sense. The river time carries along from our beginnings past memorable scenes, engages us in unexpected events, enables us to share the passage with various people, some of whom we cling to, some whose return to shore we regret and others we celebrate, and finally carries us out of sight to those falling around to the last dark bend too. In doing so, the river creek impels us to record our passage, to make some march to show that we were there. We want those coming behind us to see what we saw, to sense the joy and pain of discoveries we made, to know the journey has rewards of its own. This, then, is the beginning of my log. Having begun it late, some observations are bound to be less accurate than if made at the time. On the other hand, the lapsed time has given me a more accurate perspective of the linkage of a now visible chain. Later chapters will attempt to invoke people, places, institutions, events, and my response to them. The intent is not to mark a course for others to follow, but simply to suggest a sense of my own erratic and still incomplete passage. Written by Pat Kelly in 1999